what do six members of the cabinet and six members of the shadow cabinet have in common? What does the prime minister share in common with the leader of the opposition? The answer, of course, is that they studied for a degree in politics, economics, and philosophy. So my name is David Edmonds, and I'm a member of a very rare and threatened species. I studied PPE, and I'm neither a member of the cabinet or indeed the shadow cabinet. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the RSA uh, Thursdays, the RSA's weekly lunchtime debate on culture, politics, and society. Um, so before I begin, can you all switch off your mobile phones, please? And can I remind you that today's event is being recorded and filmed, and the podcast and video clips will be available to download from the RSA website in a few days' time. Um, so I'll explain what's going to happen today. Um, we're here to discuss whether politics needs more philosophy, and we've got a distinguished panel to address this question. The format's very simple. Each of the panellists will talk for just five minutes. We'll then have a brief discussion for another ten minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. So let me introduce our panel. We've got Nigel Warburton on the far left, who teaches at the Open University and is the author of several best-selling books on philosophy, uh, and also the interviewer on the world's greatest philosophy podcast, Philosophy Bites. I think I can get away with saying that. If I was in Parliament, I'd have to declare uh, a, a conflict of interest. Mary Warnock, you'll know all about, a former philosophy don, head of Girton College, Cambridge, and the chair of a hugely important inquiry into human fertilisation. James Cram Crabtree has an extraordinarily long CV already. Um, now the comment editor on the Financial Times. Before that, he was the managing editor of Prospect magazine. Before that, he worked in various think tanks and was an advisor in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. He also had a scholarship to Harvard and worked under the philosopher Michael Sandel. Uh, um, and his scholarship was named after one prominent US politician, Senator Fulbright. He had a Fulbright scholarship mm -hmm. to the States. Barry Gardner had a scholarship also to Harvard, named after a, uh, another US politician. You were a Kennedy scholar. Uh, and studied under the great political theorist John Rawls. But also studied philosophy at, also studied philosophy at St Andrews and spent several years working on Nietzsche at Cambridge. Uh, Nietzsche was very interested in the will to power, as you probably know, one of his most famous phrases. And Barry took Nietzsche to heart and entered Parliament, where he now exercises power as the Labour MP for Brent North. Um, so uh, let me begin with Nigel. Yeah. Um, does politics need more philosophy? The answer is very simple, no and yes. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll take them in that order. On the no side, it's very clear from what David said, there are plenty of politicians who've studied philosophy and got all the benefits of the transferable critical thinking skills, ability to analyse complex arguments and, and build cases to convincing conclusions based on logic and, and reason. So they're all there in Parliament already. We're, we've got a, a tremendous range of people who've studied philosophy. They've also got the understanding of the subject matter of philosophy that should inform their political decision making. So in a sense, we don't need more of that. And there could be an argument that we need a little bit less of that to, to have parity with other humanities subjects. Um, on the yes side, though, I think if we think of politics in a much broader sense than just party political uh, business and, and what goes on within the House of Commons and the House of Lords, it's clear that political, the wider political debate could benefit hugely from more philosophers participating actively. Uh, at the moment, what we have is perhaps half a dozen well-known philosophers, who I won't name, uh, who appear regularly on the BBC or um, as columnists in various newspapers. But there are many, many more philosophers who could make active contributions to debates about, for instance, just the topical one, torture. We had, we had um, uh, ex-President Bush talking about torture in rather, I think, sophistical terms, where he said, well, look, lawyers tell me that torture isn't illegal. And it seems to be that the conclusion that we're supposed to draw from that is that it's then acceptable to use, to well, to use waterboarding, sorry, um, tor torture, I, I have to redo that because it's being recorded. Waterboarding isn't, isn't torture, therefore it's acceptable to use waterboarding because it's legal. It's legal so it's acceptable. Now that, the idea that what's legal is acceptable could be challenged. It seems to be, ought to be challenged. It ought to be challenged vigorously, as as the idea that the definition of torture that those particular lawyers gave is an adequate one, because it seems to me that 
causing someone to, th to think that they're drowning must be a kind of torture. There's no, there's no reason. It's like saying that um, lawyers have proved that dogs aren't animals. And yet there wasn't a public debate about that informed by philosophy, people looking at the, the kinds of reasoning that could possibly have led to that sort of conclusion. Or another one that's perhaps probably more straightforwardly relevant to the British situation, what I see is the attack on university teaching <coughs> that's occurring at the moment. The debate about the relative value of the humanities is only just starting to happen. Some philosophers have a lot to contribute to that, but I think they've been hampered by a traditional approach to publishing, which is more or less the equivalent of, of the slow food movement, that within philosophy, historically, people have an idea, write an article, send it off to a journal, and a year or so later they get an answer of, as to whether it's going to be published, and a year after that it is published. And politics moves very quickly. We need philosoph philosophers using the new technology, which will allow us to contribute to the debate and make a difference to what politicians say. So I think my view is that we don't need more philosophers in Parliament in the sense of people who are trained in philosophy, but we do need more philosophers who are contributing to the wider political debate. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, Baroness Warnock. Well, I agree very largely with what Nigel says. I think, too, his waterboarding example is an extremely good example to... Um, see where um, philosophers might come in with their arguments, whether they come in from outside Parliament or within. I think it would be excellent if there were more people in Parliament, even than there are, who have studied philosophy as at least part of their undergraduate degree. Because my view is that philosophy doesn't impinge on public life because of the actual ideas that it has, but because of the habit of mind that's engendered by studying philosophy, always looking for arguments rather than assertion, distinguishing indeed between arguing for something and simply <coughs> saying it. It's the difference between the pub ball and the philosopher that is, I think, enormously important in politics and elsewhere. Um, so I think a training in philosophy is extraordinarily useful, and it doesn't ever leave people. I remember very vividly the first time that I encountered um, Freddie Howe, Earl Howe, who used to be the opposition, uh, the, the shadow minister in the House of Lords on health, and we were talking about stem cell research. And I remember thinking, this is a very clever man, and actually he must have read great to Oxford because he was using a sort of Aristotelian argument. So I looked him up and I found I'd actually examined him myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, Freddie Howe is still um, the spokesman on health, um, now on the front bench of the Conservative Party, and he is extraordinarily bright and grasps an argument very quickly and can destroy other people's arguments very adeptly. And I think this is a kind of thing that um, philosophy teaches you that you don't actually ever lose. But there is another point, and um, that is that when I was an undergraduate, donkey's years ago in the 1950s, um, moral philosophy was an extremely tedious subject in which we spent the whole time talking about whether um, moral statements were really disguised commands or disguised squeals and yells or whether what they were. <coughs> we had to concentrate on the language of morality. And it was sort of absolutely outrageous if any moral philosopher ventured an opinion, <laughs> such as whether waterboarding was wrong. Um, because they, we were thought to have no more right to our opinions than other people. Well, those days have passed, fortunately. And um, I think now it's recognised that the people who are interested in moral philosophy are interested in taking nothing for granted, in uncovering presuppositions, in trying to make people unpick their value judgments and see whether they really value the thing that they say they value or what they mean by the value that they're asserting. So moral philosophers, I think, are quite good, not at inventing values, but in uncovering values. And this is certainly something that I think does is increasingly important because 
there is, I think, a huge number of things on which everybody, value judgments on which everybody can agree. We're always told that we live in a plural society and that if, we, if we're not religious, there's no certainty in morals and so on. I think that is entirely false. I think that if you unpick people's values, a lot of them cross over and are the same. I think Kingsley Amos had it right when he said nice things are nicer than nasty things. <laughs> and I think we can all agree with that. But most of us agree as well what is nasty, like being made to think or drowning by waterboarding. So I think philosophers are useful when they are prepared to uncover what values are really are at stake in any political issue. And I think the study of philosophy, whether at school or at undergraduate level or thereafter, is very much to be encouraged and is very useful. For one thing, it makes people articulate. I can see it's made our first two speakers very articulate. Uh, James, you're next. Um, well, look, I mean, uh, I mean, it sort of, it seems to me that there are, you know, there are obviously some philosophers, you know, Heidegger, who could have stayed further away from politics and done their career a good deal of, uh, you know, a great deal of good, and others, um, I don't know, Socrates, Jesus, if you want to call him that way, who'd have lived a little bit longer. But the problem, uh, the, the, most philosophers have nothing to do with politics and public policy at all, uh, and I think um, there are probably structural reasons within philosoph philosophy as a profession as, why, as to why that is. I mean, I, as Dave mentioned, I used to work in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, and you know, philosophical arguments are simply not relevant, not considered to be relevant in um, most policy discussions. I mean, if you scratch beneath the surface of big debates or you know, the, the, the ideas that politicians talk about, then underneath you will find the ideas of, you know, I don't want to call it some defunct philosopher or other, um, but in, in terms of the way that policy is made, philosophers aren't, aren't relevant. And I suppose I wanted to dig into why that might be. I mean, I think part, part of it is that philosophical um, some things that are taken as read in philosophy or sort of f accepted wisdom are sometimes politically very unpalatable. I mean, you're probably going to speak about Rawls. Most people who do philosophy at uh, undergraduate level read Rawls, and he's, you know, lots of politicians. When I was at Prospect, James Pennell wrote an article about how important Rawls had been in his thinking. And yet, you know, Rawls' ideas are extremely radical, much more radical than almost any um, sort of sitting politician would countenance, particularly his ideas on desert, you know, that, that you don't own or earn the right to your own efforts. The same would be true with somebody like Oakeshott. I remember being told a rather charming story about Oakeshott going in and having dinner with some conservative MPs who all sort of claimed to be great Oakeshottians until they discovered what he believed and then <laughs> thought he was completely bonkers. <laughs> that there was no possible way that, um, that, that you know, politics could be run in the way that he envisioned. Um, and uh, on the other side, you know, when you look at philosophy is seen to have a role in politics, it's often used in a rather sort of slipshod way. I mean, the Labour had a communitarian moment just before the 1997 election, and, and some of the, the language of rights and responsibilities that Tony Blair used has sort of a, is a sort of implicit critique of Rawlsian liberalism and a sort of nod, nod towards, you know, Etzioni or you know, someone like Michael Sandel, but it's not as if that was a debate that was ever conducted in explicitly philosophical terms. Um, more recently, you've seen a rather creaky and I think now defunct bandwagon to use Amartya Sen's concept of capabilities, which was certainly in political terms the, probably the least fruitful um, example of a political kind of, of a philosophical concept being wheeled out. Um, but again, it, it had an almost no relationship to what Sen was actually talking about. It was just quite a handy thing that some people decided that they wanted to talk about. Um, and you look at, there's a range of other um, issues in which uh, philosophical ideas are, are badly used in politics. I mean, David and Nigel did a terrific podcast with Honora O'Neill on medical ethics and the concept of informed consent. An informed consent, deeply philosophical concept, it comes straight from the philosophy books, but her argument was a good one, which is it's a lousy way to make um, decisions, um, sort of informed decisions um, in a medical context. But again, that's not something that would be debated by philosophers. Equally, you could look at WikiLeaks, 
Um, you know, there's lots of philosophical arguments to be made about the nature of responsibility. No philosophers would be found making them, and they sort of left the field. You could look at what's happened during the recession with notions of what it is, what someone ought to be paid. All of these things, um, you know, the philosophical concept begging for philosophers to engage, but they don't. And um, I suppose what interests me is why not. Part of this is probably to do with the research assessment exercise and the incentives for academics in general. But it does seem to me that academic philosophy, not the sort that David and Nigel or, I don't know, um, A.C. Grayling uh, practice, but that which is conducted by 95% of sort of living philosophers, um, none of it concerns anything that has the remotest um, political relevance. Um, and I suspect until that changes and until more philosophers are incentivized to engage in these topics rather than one sort of slightly more abstruse uh, areas of investigation, then, um, then this, won't, um, this won't change. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. You've all kept your five minutes so far, but now we're going to the MP, so we'll see <laughs> if we can... You're last. <laughs> um, the nine months that I spent uh, studying with John Rawls literally changed my life. There was two reasons that I didn't go into academic philosophy. One was that I wasn't good enough, um, and the other was that John Rawls made me realise that it was enough talking about justice, it was time to do it, um, and to get on and try and grapple with the practical issues that arose out of it. And m my view is that our lives, all of our lives, mine certainly, veers between two poles. One is truth, and the other is reasonableness. And in a sense, if you go to the core of what Rawls' famous work, A Theory of Justice, and all his subsequent, the Dewey Lectures and the 1985 papers, were really cashing out, was that problem that we have between truth and reasonableness. And his is very much, um, if, if you go back in, in, in the history of our thought to Aristotle and how should a person live, um, a whole virtues way of, of, of looking at life and, and the virtues that we required in order to live well, to have eudaimonia, um, one of the critical virtues, of course, was dikaiosine, it was justice. Um, and that, in modern times, has moved, of course, from being a teleological endpoint, a given in your life, whether that given is imposed uh, through religion um, or whether it is uh, some concept of what a, a blueprint of a good life should be. And the Reformation blew that away. We had the wars after the Reformation, and we've had to cope with that problem of pluralism ever since then. And, and in a sense, that's what politicians um, are still coping with now. How do we construct a pluralist society, a society in which your pursuit of happiness um, is different from your pursuit of happiness, and yet we can all agree to live together? And, and Rawls, of course, came up with this, this theory, which was how to construct a society in which we would each recognize justice. And I, I was interested in what Mary said about uncovering values and, and uh, at the end of it all, how those values were very often the same. And of course, that, that was part of the whole process of reflective equilibrium. It was you have your considered moral judgments and, and you, you, you oscillate between them. You re refine them against each other to try and come up with, with an acceptable, a workable framework for society uh, and, and for you and I to live together peacefully and where we both feel we're getting more out of it uh, than we're putting into it. Um, I, I just want to, to read a couple of quotations from, from Rawls, which I think are absolutely at the heart of this. Um, I should point out here that Barry's reading from a paper that he himself appears to have written. So. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> 22 years on, I reread it this morning. And, you know, I, I, I thought, actually... <laughs> no, I, I, I just thought, actually, 
I've not got away from this in 22 years. My life is about cashing this out. Um, I said that Rawls isn't attempting to use what he calls an order antecedent to and given to us to ground our conception of justice. Rather, he maintains that this conception is justified by, and I think the quote is, its congruence with our deeper understanding of ourselves and our aspirations and our realization that given our history and the traditions embedded in our public life, it is the most reasonable doctrine for us. And of course, writing as Rawls was in the 1970s and 80s and, and thinking about this, because I think it took him about 30 years ever to publish, um, really from, from the 1940s uh, onwards, um, that was a very sensible place to locate a constructivist theory. What, of course, we've had to cope with since is globalization. What we've had to cope with since is not just, as some made the points in the 1980s, fundamentalism in the United States and, and the movement in the US about withdrawing from the public sector, withdrawing from the public arena into schools where you could teach creationism. We've had to deal with a globalization that has brought very different and conflicting ethical, moral, and religious truths into play at the same time. And that is why I think it's so difficult for us now to construct a moral theory, to construct a public space where our sense of justice is shared. I just want to read one more quote from Rawls. Moral persons are distinguished by two features. First, they are capable of having and are assumed to have a conception of their good as expressed by a rational life plan. Second, they are capable of having and are assumed to acquire a sense of justice, a normally effective desire to apply and act on the principles of justice. I think the problem is that in a globalized world, the clash of truths is so great that the sense of justice and our desire for reasonableness in our accommodation with one another makes politics a lot more difficult. Thank you very much, Barry. We'll open up to questions in a few moments, but um, I just want to ask both sides of the table a, a different question. I mean, it seems to me that there's a distinction between asking whether we need more philosophers in politics and whether we, we need more philosophical ideas to penetrate politics. And you two, on, on the right, you've both talked about John Rawls. You were both at Harvard. For those of you who don't know, John Rawls is widely regarded as uh, the most important, by far, political theorist in the, in the post-war era and wrote a book called A Theory of Justice in 1971, I think. And James was implying that actually these ideas don't penetrate politics. But, you know, um, I'd like to you know, ask James whether that's really true. But after John Stuart Mill and Bentham, Britain was very much sort of utilitarian principles were extremely influential in Britain. John, Stuart, John Rawls had a number of very radical um, proposals which haven't been implemented, but one of his suggestions was that uh, we should pay special advantage, special attention to the least advantaged in society. And it seems to me that proposal has been extremely influential in British politics and has penetrated policy at every level. Yeah, I mean, I suppose I'm not saying that in a broad sense, philosophical ideas do sort of make their way into the public sphere. Um, it would be strange if they didn't, given how many people are forced to study them. But they do so in a, they do so in a sort of haphazard and unsystematic way. Uh, I mean, as I said, you know, it's a, Rawls's principles and the way that he constructs his theory 
would be completely beyond the pale to, I imagine, almost everyone in this room and most people in, in, in politics. I mean, he's much, much more egalitarian than, you know, the median point of British public life. So uh, if, if his ideas have penetrated, then people don't understand what they mean, I suppose, is my, my point. Do you, do you want to pick up on, on, on John Rawls's influence? I mean, he's obviously influenced you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Look, I, I think these ideas do permeate society. I, I think m most British politicians would not be able to name John Rawls um, and to, to tell you what he wrote, um, far less have read it. Um, but I think... Um, the influence that those ideas have had have actually informed our public debate during the past 20 years in a quite extraordinary way. I mean, nobody now refers t to Locke in the course of a debate in the House of Commons. <laughs> of course not. Um, but nonetheless, it would be stupid to underestimate the importance that Lockean ideas, that Hobbesian ideas have had on our public consciousness. And it, it's not the job of politicians to stand up in Parliament or, or to debate in public quoting philosophers, but what it is their responsibility to do is to try and grapple with the essential principles and ideas that undergird those philosophical stances. And in, in espousing the Maximin principle in, in, you know, or the, 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 his, his outline of a well-ordered society at the back pages of the 756 pages of a theory of justice which most students have not read, you know, even though they claim to have read the book, um, of course, you don't just grab it and stick it into public policy. But, but as you said, those ideas do come in. This sense of, um, in, in fact, I don't know whether you remember the blessed Polly Toynbee, um, uh, uh, who, who wrote uh, about the extension of the camel train across the desert and how the camel train had got longer, that we had to regard the rich and poor in society um, as essentially this camel train. And unfortunately, the camel train was getting more spread out. That was Rawls, pure and simple, plucked out and, and put into the popular press. Now, did she know it? I, I suspect Polly probably did. Um, but did anybody else recognize it? No, probably not, because it doesn't need to be explicit for the ideas to have impact, for them to carry weight. There's, there's one other very brief thing that I think I'd add on that. In the States, I mean, we can't talk only about Rawls, but that, that sort of vision of Rawlsian liberalism has been enormously politically influential to the point where it's now much criticized, the idea that you can have a sort of values, relatively values-free debate in public life, which is, you know, legalistic, and which doesn't tell people the sort of the good life that they should lead. Um, that became, after 2004 in particular, that sort of criticism of the Democrats. There was a lot of hand-wringing about the fact that Democrats couldn't talk in in terms of values and talking about what the good life ought to be. So, I mean, in that sense, in a broad sense, you know, these are obviously influential, but in kind of day-to-day -day policy making, there's no, no one is engaging with these ideas in sort of terms that philosophers would recognize, and that's mostly because the philosophers have sort of exited the field. As a matter of fact, I think there is one philosopher more influential than rules on practicing politicians, Though if they understood his teaching, they probably would never admit to having read a word that he wrote, and that's Machiavelli. Um, it's very clear that most politicians do read or are influenced by the ideas of Machiavelli. Um, I wonder if uh, Barry's got anything to say about that. Never <laughs> studied him. <laughs> <laughs> Just practiced the Never arts. intend to. <laughs> no, no, but you're wrong never to intend to, because actually yes, right. Machiavelli... I mean, the adjective Machiavellian has a bad name, obviously. But the fact is that he does engage with this particular problem of how far um, public and private morality can go along together. And this is a terribly important problem for politicians. Um, well, particularly Lib Dem politicians. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Let me turn to the, the, the flip side of the, of the coin. So we talked about uh, philosophical ideas penetrating uh, the body politic. You were talking earlier about the importance of having philosophers, trained philosophers, uh, in politics. And you mentioned the waterboard. You both mentioned the waterboarding case. Uh, I wonder if I can put you on the spot and ask for another 
real example where having philosophers, more philosophers in the House of Commons or the House of Lords would have made a practical difference to a piece of legislation. Uh, well, that you're, you're more likely to find this in the House of Lords than the House of Commons, and that's for sure. Um, this is because we have more time to talk. <laughs> um, and, and also come into the chamber and do talk far more than people in the House of Commons. So in the House of Lords, I can certainly think of cases where philosophical ideas about uh, the body and the soul, say, have made a huge difference to people's attitude towards um, using live embryos in research. Um, and this has been, this is <coughs> intrinsically a philosophical concept. And what I'm arguing for is the utility of people who have some idea of how to handle this kind of general concept, rather than people who immediately say it makes me feel sick or um, it's going to be unpopular with the Daily Mail or whatever it is. Um, they do actually think whether they do want to treat um, embryos of 14 days age um, the same way as they treat grown human beings. They can actually think in those abstract terms. I don't know if this um, directly affects legislation, but clearly pronouncements about freedom of speech have, could have been better informed by knowledge of the philosophical history of debates about freedom of speech through, from Milton through Mill. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when reasonably eminent politicians say freedom of speech is okay, but you need to speak responsibly, which seems to imply that anybody who speaks irresponsibly isn't genuinely speaking freely, or that they're not, then the freedom of speech doesn't allow you to say anything, in which case freedom of speech becomes, I mean, obviously freedom of speech always has some limits, but where you draw the line is a key question for freedom of speech. But to say that the line has to be drawn at the point where you don't offend people, is, is to show ignorance of the whole history of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty and the important arguments that he raised there about where the limits might be drawn. There is one, can I say yes, one yes, more? Yes, yes, um, yes. I think the example that someone gave of Honora O'Neill, you did, um, was um, extremely useful because one thing that I think philosophers are, or do enjoy doing, is pricking bubbles, is... Um, exposing cliches is unpicking things that people use as mantras and just say over and over again. And certainly informed consent. You scratch a doctor and he talks about informed consent. It means nothing. It's absolute garbage. Um, <laughs> but I think that you do need that particular critical point of view, which I think people studying philosophy as undergraduates acquire and never lose. Barry, okay. I, I think they're both excellent examples. I would add another one, which, um, in fact, we're debating in, in, in Westminster this afternoon, um, uh, and that is climate change. Um, and this concept that we have to think in terms of justice, not as simply between people separated by geography across the globe, but people separated by generations across time, uh, and our responsibilities to them, um, and what those are, and how we manage resources. So all of the questions around sustainable development, all of the questions around the environment and around climate change are, are fundamentally philosophical questions about how we share resources. <laughs>